God's grand invitation begins with him. God so loved the world. God's solution for society begins with God. Our solutions always begin with ourselves. Have you noticed? I'll think more. I'll work more. I'll exercise more. We rely on muscle or savvy or money. But when they run out, our hope runs out. Not so with God. His invitation begins with him to trust him. And he's never weary, he's never worried, he's never wounded. And God loves the world, this world, this toxic, divided, angry, oppressive, suffocating world. God loves this world. Why? Because we belong to him. Can I pause and ask you the most important question you'll ever be asked in your entire life? And that is simply this. Do you believe God loves you? Amen. Jesus said, unless you have the heart of a child, what about the rest of you? I know, I mean, do you really believe it? And do you believe it down deep in the inner parts of your heart? that no one else sees, that only you know. You believe that you have never lived one unloved day in your life. Do you believe that the only vote that matters has been cast in your favor? Do you believe that the one who knows you best loves you most? Do you believe that? Do you believe that the creator is proud of you, cherishes you, yes, boasts on you? Do you believe that he loves you? And he loves you so much that here's what he did. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. He has loved you with an everlasting love. That is to say, his love for you does not depend upon the size of your waist, the balance of your bank account, or the number of followers you have on Twitter. And he loves you so much that he gave you the greatest gift, and here it is, his one and only son. Don't hurry too quickly past that phrase. Only begotten son in other translations. The Greek phrase is monogenes. M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S. Mono meaning only genes. Yeah, you see it. Genes. Genetic connection. race, family, offspring. Jesus alone is the monogenetic Son of God. We're all children of God, but only Jesus is the one and only, the only begotten, the monogenetic Son of God because only Christ has God's genes, his genetic makeup. He and God have the same essence, the same eternal lifespan, the same unending wisdom, the same tireless energy. Every attribute we attribute to God, we can attribute to Jesus. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yet the most astounding attribute ever spoken about the monogenetic or the uniqueness of Jesus came in the form of a question from Jesus himself. Can any one of you convict me of a single misleading word, a single sinful act? If I ask you that question about me, every hand will go up. And you ask me that question, I could probably find something. But you know, no one could convict Jesus. No one. Even at his crucifixion, they had to hustle up some false accusations. The apostle Peter, who lived in the shadow of Jesus for three years, recorded he never did one thing wrong. After three years, he never did one thing wrong. Not once said anything amiss. Now, why does this matter? 
Well, since Jesus was sinless, he can serve as a substitute for sinners. I cannot pay the price for your sins. I've got my own. You cannot pay the price for mine. You've got your own. But Jesus can. You see, God's grand invitation to you and me boils down to this. He wants us to spend eternity with him. That this life is just a, just a brief fleck of a moment, just a shadow in which we make a decision, yes or no, about God's grand invitation. And God's grand invitation for you is this. I am creating a new kingdom. I'm going to restore this planet to its intended beauty. There will be my Garden of Eden, and I want you to be a part of it with me. And that eternal kingdom will be tireless, will be tearless, will be graveless, and it will be sinless. There will be no curse. There will be no Satan. There will be no wars. There will be no division. Heaven will be perfect. But I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Will God populate his kingdom with imperfect people? No. He will take the only perfect person who ever lived and allow that perfect person to take the place of imperfect people like you and me. He will be our substitute. And our loving God and our just God will rightly punish Jesus for sins Jesus never committed and give us the credit for the sinless life of Jesus Christ. Again, the Apostle Peter summarizes it. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Look at this. The righteous, who's that? Jesus. For the unrighteous, who's that? You and me. To bring you to God. When I was in college, I drove my car into a ditch. Dad always told me, keep your eye on the road. Pay attention. And Dina and my wife is still telling me that. <laughs> but that day my mind wandered, my eyes followed my wandering mind, and I drove into a ditch out into the country. I even knocked over a mailbox. I was able to get the car out of the ditch and lent my way to a body shop, all the while dreading the cost of the repair and the call to my dad. The cost was more than I could pay, and so I called him. He listened, and after a few questions, he told me to give the phone to the body shop manager. You want to guess what my dad told him? The body shop manager listened as my dad said, I'll pay for it. Now, why did my dad do that? He didn't wreck the car. He didn't take his eyes off the road. He didn't end up in the ditch. He didn't do that. But you know what? He knew I couldn't pay. He knew I simply did not have the capacity to cover the payment. And you know what else? He knew I belonged to him. He knew I belonged to him. And since I couldn't pay... And since I belong to him, he did what I could not do. You know what? Jesus paid the price for you. Jesus paid the price for you. He not only issued the invitation, he covered the cost of it. Those times you ended up in the ditch, those times you took your eyes off the road, those times that you ended up bent and beat up, Jesus has you covered why? Well, because you can't pay. You can't be good enough, right enough, strong enough. You just simply can't. It's not within you. But Jesus can, and Jesus was. Besides, he has not forgotten. You belong to him. You belong to him. And he never forgets whose we are. We are his. And God loves us so much that he gave us his monogenetic, his one and only son. Look at this. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever. Is that not just the most wonderful word? 
Would you please raise your hand if you're a whoever? Wow. So this invitation is for you. Whoever believes in him. You know, whoever means whenever and however. Whenever God finds you, however God finds you. In rehab, in the midst of bankruptcy, in the midst of a divorce, God's gospel has a whoever policy. I took this whoever policy to California some time back. I wanted to show it to my Uncle Billy. Billy reminded me so much of my dad. Both of them were square like a radiator. Both of them told silly jokes. And both of them had a penchant for cheap cigars. But unlike my dad, Billy did not have a love for Jesus. Billy was supposed to come to Texas and see us, but then came the bone cancer. And knowing his time was passing quickly, and knowing my father was already in heaven, I just felt that it fell to me to go and make sure Billy knew about God's grand invitation. And so I boarded the flight for California. And when I got to Billy's house, the house was full of family and friends. Billy was in hospice care. He was swallowed up by his recliner. His once robust body was frail and weak, skeletal. And his eyes were closed. The house was abuzz with family and friends, and I wondered if I would have a chance to talk to Billy. And if I did, would Billy even understand what I was saying? So I waited. And then, miraculously, the house was empty. Everybody had gone out into the front yard. I don't know why, maybe to say goodbye or say hello. And it was just Billy and me in the living room. Well, I grabbed my folding chair and I pulled it right up next to Billy's recliner. And I reached over and I took his hand, so bony, so thin. And I leaned over, face, my face just a couple of inches from his. And I said, Uncle Billy, it's Max, Jack's boy. No response. I said, Billy, do you want to go to heaven? And I'm here to say his eyes popped open saucer wide. And he leaned his head up. And he answered with a voice laced with doubt. He said, I want to. And I told him about God's grand invitation. And I said, all you got to do, Billy, is say yes. And I'm going to lead you lead us in a prayer and if you say amen that's your yes I knew he couldn't say it out loud and so I led him in a prayer much like the one I'm going to lead us in just a few moments and at the end of the prayer I said amen and he said amen <laughs> and by the time I was back in Texas Billy was gone. Did he wake up in heaven? According to God's whoever policy, he did. Because whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever. Billy was not too late, but some people will be. You see, God's gospel is never forced on anyone. And there are many who say no to God's grand invitation for whatever reason. They spend a lifetime saying, God, just leave me alone. Leave me alone. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say about sin. I don't care what you say about salvation. God, just leave me alone. And on that last day, God will do just that. Can we be very clear? Hell is not the destination reserved 
for people who seek God but struggle. Hell is the chosen destination of those who rebel against God and succeed. The doors of hell are locked from the inside. People who spend their lives saying, God, leave me alone, will have their request honored. These are the people who tell Jesus, we don't want this man to be our king. We don't want him. And they reject Christ. But then there are those who say, yes, yes. What many have done even here today, they say yes. And to those who say yes, the most wonderful words are spoken. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I would suggest to you that one moment in heaven is worth a lifetime of pain on earth. And something wonderful happens when somebody says yes to God. Something happens to that person that changes their life. It is a game changer. Life still has problems. Life still has pain. Life still has long days and short nights. But life has this. Life has hope. Do you know this hope? Do you? If not, do you want this hope? God's invitation is yours for the taking. There are three ways to respond to God's grand invitation. Some of you hear this message and say, oh my, that's me. That's my song. And I've been singing it for years or weeks or days, but yes, I've already said yes. Thanks for the reminder. I needed it today. Others of you respond by saying, I once said yes, but I need to say yes again. All the cares of the world, the worries of the world have, have, I've drifted away, but I'm coming back. And then others say, oh, now I get it. You mean he died for me? He's coming for me? He will empower me? (sighs) I'm all in. Count me yes on that one. How will you respond today? Let's all bow our heads and please close your eyes and think about how you respond, personally respond. And if you're coming back to Jesus, if you just want to say, Jesus, I wandered away, but I'm coming home, would you signify, stand before heaven and just stand up, just stand up? And... If you're saying yes to Jesus for the very first time and you want heaven to know, would you also just rise to your feet? Just show heaven that you're counting on God and God can count on you. Let's continue to pray as people are making an eternal decision. Amen. 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 Bless you, Lord. And now let's all rise to our feet in a prayer of gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for these who have said yes to you today. We bless you for the work that you have done. We glorify your name because you and you alone are the Lord of the harvest. Thank you, Lord, for populating heaven. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, amen.